While the Grammys are just around the corner, here to preview music's biggest night is Harvey Mason Jr., CEO of the Recording Academy, which puts on the Grammy Awards. He himself is an accomplished music producer, having produced for music legends from Aretha Franklin to Michael Jackson and Justin Timberlake. Harvey, welcome back to the show. It's great to see you. Thank you, Jennifer. It's good to be here. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So you're taking the Grammys back to Los Angeles this year. It's home base. What can we expect for music's biggest night? Well, first off, I'm so excited to be back in L.A. We're at Crypto.com Arena, kind of our home court here. So we got home court advantage going. Uh, we're excited to be here, but we're more excited about just the music and the stars and the icons, legends, and then the entire music community coming together to celebrate music back in LA, back in one place, in one building, sharing great music, great camaraderie. It's going to be an amazing weekend. What's the biggest thing that you think we have to look forward to as viewers? I think we have a lot to look forward to, but the race for album of the year is something that I don't think we've seen before. This many iconic artists, this much great creativity and innovation around music, also, I think you can look forward to the diversity of different styles of people and music and genre. Or think about album of the year. Think about best new artists. We have probably six or seven different genres just in, in best new artist category. We have half of our major nominee recipients are women. Half of them are people of color. So we've got diversity in so many different areas. And it's just really exciting to see this much coming together around music. I'm glad you brought up diversity because you personally have made a lot of changes when it comes to diversity at the Recording Academy since taking the helm as CEO. Uh, membership nominations, as you just alluded to, are the most diverse than they've ever been. What's your goal for the Recording Academy this year? Well, you should know. I know it's a surprise, Jennifer, but I am a diversity person. I am from the diverse community that we hope to represent. I've generally been thought of as uh, someone that falls into an underserved or underrepresented category my entire life since I was born. And I'll go more into my history and my experiences, but I bring with me to the role uh, a desire to make sure that we're reflective of the entire industry. I bring with me my experience in the industry for the last 30 years working as a songwriter and producer. And I bring with me just the lens that I see things through, which is inclusion and equity makes sense it's not performative it's not because we think it sounds good or it's a cool buzzword it's because greatness comes when different people from all different experiences and all different backgrounds come together whether that's to make decisions whether that's to make music whether that's to make a tv show it makes sense when you reach out to other groups and you invite people in and you listen and you learn and you collaborate to me that's the spirit of music, that's the spirit of artistry, and that's the spirit of the Academy. Are we seeing enough representation when it comes to female song songwriters specifically? There was some research done from the University of Southern California that sort of showed, if you looked from 2020 going backwards a decade, that we hadn't seen as much contribution perhaps and strides made when it c comes to women. Certainly you see the nominations now for song of the year, album of the year, many of them are solo female artists. Have we made enough stride there? Uh, what's your sense? I think we're getting better. I don't think we've made enough stride. We've made huge strides. We set a goal at the Academy to invite 2,500 new members. We're 77% of the way to that goal. That's a big jump for us and the percentage of women members and voters has grown for us immensely. I think you're seeing a difference in the nominations and hopefully the winners going forward, but there's still much more to do, both for gender equity and also just people of color and representing music accurately. We know 34, 33, 34% 34 of music created and consumed is Black music, so we need to make sure we're reflecting that, and we need to do the same with women voters in our organization. Harvey, what do you think is the biggest challenge facing the music industry right now? Wow, that's a whole show, Jennifer, probably a whole other <laughs> interview, but there are many challenges facing our industry. I think there are great opportunities for our industry right now as well. The ability for consumers to reach and access our music is exciting. I love the fact that we can make something on a Friday and our fans or our consumers can listen to it on maybe Friday or maybe the next day. That's exciting. I think what's a challenge and something the Academy is working really hard on is how do creators get compensated? How do we get remunerated for our efforts and our art. 
that is something that's going to have to be figured out. It's going to have to be discussed and legislated. I know I've talked to you about that before, but our advocacy team works really, really hard on that year in and year out. Uh, but that's something that needs to be figured out. I also think the future of genres and the future of um, all things music, things are changing. Lines are coming down. Borders are falling. We're hearing music in the top 10 in different languages. You see, uh, we've got an album for the first time in the history of the Academy in an all Spanish speaking language uh, as an album of the year nominee with Bad Bunny. So I think that's going to be the future of music is, is how do you evaluate different genres? How do you program playlists or other forms of consumption based on genres? I don't think you do. I think that's going to probably change in the near future. And I think how musicians and creators and writers and artists are compensated fairly is something else that we're going to have to address coming up. Yeah, on that compensation issue, I wonder what's it going to take to get streaming sites like Spotify to pay creators and artists more favorably? I think it's going to take more conversation and just more dialogue. You know, the streamers and the different DSPs are, they are really our partners and we love what they've done for the industry. They've allowed us to access our fans, our consumers. They've allowed us to get our music out more readily. There's less gatekeeping happening right now. So we love that about the streamers. There's discovery. There's there's the opportunity to find great new music that you might never heard. There's opportunity to get music quicker and more variety. So that's a positive. I think the question is how do we come to a fair solution around the economics of songwriters, performers, labels, publishers, independent artists, DIY artists, all these different buckets need to be addressed. And I think it's really going to come down to having meaningful and hopefully constructive, productive dialogue with the DSPs. And it probably will include the legislators. Switching gears a bit, the Senate Judiciary Committee recently had a hearing on Ticketmaster and its handling of Taylor Swift's concert ticket sales and really the, the concert ticketing industry overall. During that hearing, we heard from witnesses in the music industry who described a, quote, monopoly-like control over venues, artists, and consumers. Do you think that Ticketmaster has too dominant a position? Should it be broken up? Is there a better, better model for concert ticketing? Perhaps could NFTs play a role there? It's hard to predict what the future of ticketing and live music could be. I think Clyde Lawrence did an incredible job at his testimony uh, in front of the, the committee the other day. I watched it and I listened to it. It was compelling. I think there's a lot to that issue. There's a lot to be discussed. There's a lot to be figured out. And what does the future look like, I think, is the question you asked me. And that can be asked about live music and ticketing. I don't have all the answers. I just know that music is important. Music is powerful. Making sure musicians are able to distribute their art, share their craft, share their talent uh, in whatever means possible is, is vital. And I think the idea of artists being able to go make a living, whether that be through streaming or performing live or publishing or, or their main recordings, I think it's important that we advocate on their behalf. On that revenue question, I do want to ask you about NFTs because you and I have talked about this in the past. And last time we spoke, it seemed like NFTs could be a major alternative revenue stream at some point in the future, an alternative business model. But given the crypto crash, the downdraft uh, in valuations that we've seen in many NFTs, do you still believe that NFTs hold promise for the music industry? Jennifer, you're so further along in your journey of understanding that than I am. I will say that you just don't know what the future of technology is going to hold. I was studying very conscientiously on crypto and NFTs and what that could potentially mean for our industry. And all that's been turned upside down just in the last few months. So we'll watch it closely. The thing I'm very proud of about the Academy is that we're Looking forward, we're thinking about what's around the next corner, whether that be NFT, Web3, other digital opportunities, but we will watch it and we're committed to making sure we're listening, we're conscientious, and we're paying attention to the point where we're not isolating ourselves. We're not closing ourselves off to any possibilities, whether that's NFT or otherwise. So if that makes sense and our music community can be, can be served or benefit from an NFT platform, we'll absolutely be there. All right, I want to end this on a fun note. You're a music producer. You have produced for so many legends, as we said at the top, from Aretha Franklin to Michael Jackson, Justin Timberlake. What is it that makes a hit song? So hard. If I could tell you what it was, I'd write it down and then I would either sell it or I'd give it to all of our members or I'd just keep it in the back of my mind so I could write hits every time. I don't think it's something that you can define. 
or verbalized, but I do believe many hits have one thing in common, and that's uh, a, a depth and an emotion and a connection from a real place. For me, a hit resonates because as a listener, you feel something, you believe something, it hits you either here or here, and it has a weight to it. And I don't care if you're singing about partying or your girlfriend who just broke your heart or you know losing someone or finding someone. It has to be from the heart. It has to be felt. It has to be cared for. It has to be come from a place of passion in my experience. And I'm sure there's an outlier here or there, but those are the songs to me that tend to be hits. Well, we'll have to leave it there, Harvey. We so appreciate it. We could talk about this all day long, I know. Hope to have you back soon. Thank you so much, Jennifer. That's Harvey Mason Jr., CEO of the Recording Academy. The Grammys air on February 5th on CBS at 8 p.m. Eastern.